Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Northshire Presents. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Person, Events Manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York. Here, as I so often am these days with my good friend and colleague, Davith Wood, Event Manager for Northshire Bookstore in Manchester, Central Vermont. Before we get started, Davith is going to introduce our guest this evening, but before we get started, a couple of very quick notes. First of all, if you have any questions at all for our author this evening, please use the Q&A box that you will find at the bottom of your screen to pose those questions. You can type those in there at any point throughout the night and we will save them up and pose them for you when we get to the audience question and answer session at the end of the evening. So please make use of that chat, of that Q&A box at any point. Um, and then also, and before we get started, a note of thanks. Um, indie bookselling is a, a hard business, uh, even in good times, and the last couple of years have been pretty rough, um, but Northshire has been making it through, thanks to the incredible loyalty and support of customers like you. We couldn't do this without you, and we're very grateful to you for being here this evening and for continuing to support your local indie. Thank you so much, and without further ado, Davith is going to introduce our guest tonight. Thank you, Rachel. It's my great pleasure to welcome back to Northshire Willard Stern Randall for his new book, The Founder's Fortunes, How Money Shaped the Birth of America. Randall is a distinguished scholar in history and professor emeritus at Champlain College. Prior to academia, he worked for 17 years as an investigative reporter, during which he garnered the National Magazine Award, the Hillman Prize, the Loeb Award, and the John Hancock Prize, eventually pursuing advanced studies in history at Princeton. As a biographer and lecturer, he specializes in the history of the founding era, a biographer of Benjamin and William Franklin, of Benedict Arnold, which received four national awards and was a New York Times notable book, of Thomas Jefferson, chosen by the Publishers Weekly as one of the 10 most notable books of the year, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and Ethan Allen. He's a co-authored collections and biographies and e-books with his wife, the biographer and award-winning poet Nancy Nara. Jack Kelly, the author of Valcor and a friend of Northshire, says that Randall offers a refreshing perspective on the nation's founding. The Founder's Fortunes is an eminently readable book with the sharp vignettes and incisive character portraits that bring history to life. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire, Willard Stern Randall. Willard, take it away. I'm so glad to be back at Northshire, even if it's only virtually. Uh, I've been coming to Northshire since 1993 with my Jefferson book, uh, and the, the Morrows for so many years were so gracious in uh, hosting uh, me and um, other authors. So I have a fondness and a long attachment for, for Northshire. Um, what I try to do when I come, and, 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 I, and I, I come no matter what the weather is, by the way, um, in when Tropical Storm Irene hit in 2011, uh, we actually took uh, a road being built by army engineers to get to Northshire. And I was so glad not only to make it, but to find so many enthusiastic people who had also gone out to come to a bookstore to listen to a historian uh, to talk about uh, the founding era. So uh, for so many reasons, I'm glad to be here. What I try to do at first to explain why I write a book, a particular book. And, and in this case, it's really because a neighbor, an old friend, sort of nagged me for years. How did the money work? How did they have a revolution? What did they do for money? Uh, and that question just kept after me as I wrote other books. And it, it's very hard to find out. There haven't been many books that look at the revolution uh, from uh, the standpoint of, of, of economics or, or money or uh, just the nuts and bolts of uh, keeping an army in the field and the lives. So uh, I decided finally that this was the book. And, and, and what, one of the things that also pulled me along was I, I love to read documents. I mean, I, that's, that's what I've done for most of my adult life. And it's easy to read so many that you forget the most important ones. So I picked up the Declaration of Independence and took a fresh look at it. And once you get past the beautiful rhetoric of Thomas Jefferson uh, and uh, when in the course of human events and, and et cetera, et cetera, when you get down halfway and you get into the, to the prosecutorial language of Jefferson, who in, sounds as if he's indicting King George III, uh, 
then you get a, a new slant on uh, why the revolution and why, uh, why people like George Washington, who wasn't exactly the most revolutionary of people, uh, would stake everything on. In fact, it's right there in, in the Declaration of Independence at the, at the very end, uh, when they uh, are supposed to put their names on it, uh, the, it, it ends with the, with the words, we each pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Uh, so what about those words? Yes, they pledged their lives. It's a revolution. If, if they were caught, there was no question what was going to happen to them. Uh, 30 years before the Declaration of Independence, Scottish earls uh, and, and, and men in kilts with claymores uh, attacked uh, British troops and were slaughtered. And the earls themselves were taken to London and they were executed in the execution ritual of the British, hanging, drawing, and quartering. And when uh, John Hancock uh, went through the old gate, as it's called, into London, uh, he passed, passed columns on the top of which were the skulls of the three Scottish lairds who had led the rising of 1745. So they were all aware of what could happen if a revolution uh, went awry. And, and there had never been a successful revolution. So why would they put everything on the line, their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor? Well, that leads to the next question. What were their fortunes? What, were, what was at stake other than their lives? Uh, were, were these all wealthy men? Uh, why would they say that in their lives, their fortunes? Well, part of what would happen if they lost uh, the revolution or they were captured was everything they and their family and their heirs had would be taken over by the king. So it wasn't just a, a, an idle phrase. Um, so I decided to, to find out all I could about the founding fathers uh, who had fortunes and what those fortunes were, and then how fortunate they were uh, when all was said and done and the new nation survived. Uh, and it's, it's not just curiosity about how rich were they. Um, there's, also a, there's also behind it uh, a thesis that's held up for over a hundred years uh, from a time that in many ways was as turbulent as ours with as much division and political upheaval. And that was in, the, in, in, in around uh, 1913, where you had the Socialist Party gaining strength every election, uh, where in Russia, the Russian Revolution was coming on. It was a whole period of re revolutions uh, where the labor unions were being uh, crushed uh, by very wealthy men, that we call robber barons. Uh, so the mood of the country was very explosive when Charles Beard, an economic uh, professor at Columbia, um, brought out one of his books uh, that basically uh, took the founding fathers and knocked them off their pedestals. And once they were down on the ground, he went through their pockets and found uh, bonds and stocks and he concluded from that, along with a lot of research, that the founding fathers were in it for the money. So that, that is called the progressive, the beginning of the progressive era. It's the economic interpretation of the constitution. And for a hundred years, that is basically the direction in which the studies of the founding fathers uh, had been going. In the 1960s, there was a rebirth of interest uh, in, the, in the founding fathers as our the centennial the, or the bicentennial of the revolution was coming on and there were vast research projects funded by uh, the US government. So in the 1960s, when I was beginning to do research uh, in, in, in the early days of my writing of history, um, out came these magnificent sets, multi-volume sets that purported to have everything each founding father wrote. 
Uh, I mean, I, I had I had already read six volumes of Douglas Southerl Freeman on George Washington. I couldn't imagine that it wasn't anything that they had, that he had left out. But then along come the Washington Papers and the Franklin Papers and the Jefferson Papers, uh, which some of these projects are taking more time to complete than the authors had uh, had lived. Uh, but it's been what it has made possible is a new kind of research where you can go back to all the primary sources uh, and have a fresh look and then assemble your own evidence to, to, to question the prevailing wisdom of the progressive era, for example. So and one of the clues I had from reading the Declaration of Independence was the first article uh, that Jefferson wrote uh, of the offenses of the English king that warranted uh, a, a, such, a, such a, a risky endeavor as challenging the monarchy. And the very first complaint in the Declaration of Independence, we were not allowed to have our own banks or our own currency. What? Well, how, how did, it, it was my friend's question. How did it work if they couldn't have banks, they couldn't have their own currency? So that gave me sort of a, a line to, to pursue as I went through and looked at uh, each of the founders that, I, that I've studied. And I, I haven't, uh, I've come up with my own list of, of founders. It, it, it can include everybody. It certainly can include all of the Continental Congress or the Constitutional Convention. But these are the people who had the most at risk uh, financially. And that's what I've been looking at. Um, but also, I wanted to see what the impact of their of their fortunes was, the impact of their wealth on the foundation of the country, on the course of the revolution, on the policies of a new nation. So, with all that in mind, I started to work uh, with Benjamin Franklin. Uh, you'd think we all know about Benjamin Franklin. Most of what we know about Benjamin Franklin, we cut, we get from Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he was sort of the the, the first PR man, and he was his own first client. So one of the most famous American books is his autobiography, which he wrote to come down in the afternoon to the garden of the Bishop of St. Asaph's and read about his unusual experience as a young, a new thing called an American. Uh, American was pejorative then. If you look at the Oxford, uh, Oxford Encyclopedic Dictionary, it was not used to describe what we call Americans now. It was used to describe uh, Native Americans. But to use it, uh, Franklin wrote to his son that Franklin could not get a government job in England because he was considered too much of an American. So what was this new person? Uh, Franklin was writing about himself, and I start with that point with him. But we th we think we know Benjamin Franklin if we if we see him uh, in portraits of the of the, the the authors of the the peace treaty at the end of the revolution, or we see him standing in a shed while his son runs out with a kite into an electrical storm. Uh, but what did he really look like? What was his life really like? Well, it, it, first of all, he's one of 17 children. Um, uh, his, he, he was in, in such a large family in such a small house. Um, he, he, was, he was poor. His father was making soap and candles and running a little store. But Benjamin Franklin was born poor. How did he get in... Uh, half a lifetime to be one of the wealthiest Americans, which he was by the time he was uh, 46 years old and retired from actively printing. So what I've done is work through uh, his career. So he came to Philadelphia. Everybody knows he had a couple of loaves of bread, not under his arm. He had two Dutch coins left from selling his books in Boston. Uh, and he used those books to go go into a Quaker church and sleep because he was freezing from uh, rowing across the Delaware River. Um, but he had no money, but he had an incredible skill at printing. He was already a master printer. Uh, and, and to see how he got his wealth, it's how he, he took the idea of printing and turned it into um, a modern publishing business. 
he's really the first American publisher. And that's that's what his what his much of his wealth came from. So he set up a newspaper when he was very young. Uh, it survives in the form of the uh, the Daily Pennsylvanian, the University of Pennsylvania's paper. But that's Franklin's paper. And in it, he advertised and sold everything out of a storefront uh, with Deborah Franklin at, pretty much at the register when people came in and Deborah Fra Franklin keeping the books. And by the way, she was a very good bookkeeper. Um, and it was very mom and pop business at first. But he always was open to new ideas and one day in the, in the late uh, 1730s, a preacher came to town, George Whitfield, right out of Oxford, an evangelist uh, with a fantastic voice that could carry a long distance, long gold hair, um, with two horses, one that he was on and the other behind him had a portable pulpit. And he was riding from town to town, uh, from Newport, Rhode Island, eventually to Georgia, where he was raising money to open an orphanage. And when he got to Philadelphia, uh, Franklin, as a, as a journalist would, I was curious to come and hear him because he heard Whitfield could attract a huge crowd. Uh, and it was so big that Franklin uh, had, being a bit of a, a math a bug himself, had to figure out how big. So he actually walked around the the, uh, um, the the outside of the crowd uh, and then allowed two and a half square feet for each person. And he did the math and he concluded that there were 25,000 people. At this time, there were only 10,000 people in Philadelphia. So they were really coming from New Jersey. They were coming from the hinterlands of Pennsylvania, from Delaware, to hear George Whitfield. Where am I going with this? George, uh, George Whitfield was an opportunity waiting for Benjamin Franklin after he heard the sermon, and by the way, emptied all the money he had with him. And I, in the book, I, I quote him uh, where he talks about how he, he was only going to give the copper and then he wound up giving the silver and then he wound up giving the gold. Uh, but then he, he more than earned it back because he arranged immediately to meet Whitfield before he could leave town and struck up a deal where Benjamin Franklin became George Whitfield's publisher publishing his sermons, his travels, his writings that went on for years. And Franklin became uh, the most successful printer at that point, uh, because what he came up with was also the idea that he couldn't do it all himself. He couldn't keep all the money for himself. So he took on partners. He set up partnerships with printers up and down the coast. He printed top quality printing of the pages, and then he shipped off the pages, and in each of the towns where there were other printers, they they bound them, and this also took care of dissertation. So George Washington was reading uh, a, a book that Benjamin Franklin had printed and sent off to Hunter's Bookstore uh, in, in Williamsburg. So he kept coming up with new ways, uh, not only to make money, but to really please the public. Uh, now, here's a man who made his money on sermons, but he never went to one other than Whitfield's. Uh, he supported eight different denominations in Philadelphia, and he didn't go to services because while everybody else was off at church, he did his experiments. Sunday was when he did his experiments. But everything he did, he wrote about, he publicized. His, his idea was that if people like what he's doing, know what he's doing, they will come and do business with him. And he was so successful uh, that by the time he was 48 years old, I calculated his, his, his income then was about our money, $300,000 a year, which was an awful lot of money for the time. Now I calculated, and that's one of the things in this book that I've done that's a little unusual. Often in a history book, you'll see that so-and-so made 15 pounds sterling a year. Well, how much would that buy today? So you can use a, a, a scale to convert uh, and use, find the website uh, measuring worth. And you can go from pounds to dollars. You can go from that time to this time. And I, in this book, I show what the money now would, would mean. So Benjamin Franklin was already wealthy uh, with businesses and partnerships and income coming in. 20 years of steady income from his printing businesses, his partnerships. Uh, and at the same time, he was writing the best-selling piece of writing in colonial America, his famous 
Poor Richard's Almanac, which um, sold 10,000 copies a year. Uh, but if you look at the population of British America at the time, which is not even 2 million people, that today would be a runaway bestseller. So I try to put things in, in modern terms to get how they, the scale that they looked, uh, how they looked to people at the time. So Franklin, printer, uh, well, he had all, all this money coming in. What did he do with it? He invested in real estate. Uh, he eventually owned 89 properties, rental properties in Philadelphia. Uh, you knew he was doing well when he, he, he got a, away from the shop and got a nice house down the street. How do you know he was doing well? Uh, because he was robbed. Uh, and in his paper, he advertises uh, it, what, what was taken, which if you look at what he had, including a beaver hat and a, a very nice cape and suit, said he was already uh, uh, doing very well uh, when he was still in his 30s. But he also was at risk, not just financially, but European wars spilled over into the, into the colonies in North America. So for the first time, Franklin uh, was threatened in a war, uh, was with, in King George's War uh, in, this, in the 1740s, when privateers, uh, French and Spanish privateers, were sailing into Delaware Bay, Delaware Bay and then sailing up as far as they could, ransacking plantations 30 miles from Philadelphia. What did Franklin do? Well, Franklin had to do something because the Penn family who owned Pennsylvania were, would not uh, spend any money on defense. And the Quakers who populated and were the politicians of Pennsylvania uh, did not believe in war. Franklin couldn't sit there and watch everything he was working for and, and, and those of other people like him. Uh, so he actually set up a militia and he built forts and he borrowed cannon. Uh, and he's, he, he raised actually 12,000 men uh, that he could call on. He actually walked the, the parapet of a fort a few blocks from his house at night, but he and his men had built the association fort. So it's, it's, he fortifies Philadelphia for the first time. He will do it again in the revolution. So Franklin became the leader uh, of the what they called the Quaker party, even though it, but Quakers were not participating in it. Uh, the anti-Penn party, because he believed in defense. He also believed in protecting businesses, protecting trade. So I have followed him along that path uh, un un until the Revolutionary War. And in the Revolutionary War, the British occupied Philadelphia. And Franklin was at, already in, in Paris uh, trying to get all the money he could get from uh, uh, King Louis the Sixteenth, and he was highly successful. I'll not come back to that a little later. Uh, but Franklin was interested in two things: commerce and defense, uh, from a very early time. Um, so that's Franklin, and he will he will come up with the plan of union to try to pull the colonies together and make them uh, semi-independent. In, the, in his famous Albany Plan of Union uh, by the time he's 48 years old. So we need to step aside at that point to meet George Washington. George Washington was also, well, not poor, but his mother had been widowed three times. Uh, the life expectancy of a man on the Virginia frontier was in the low 40s. Uh, she was widowed three times. And she'd become very possessive of anything that she'd been left or inherited. And she was also apparently a magnificent rider. And so she was very careful about her horses. And George Washington in, may have in, forever antagonized his mother in a way that most kids couldn't imagine by riding her best horse until it fell down and died from a burst uh, aorta. So he, he was always on the bad side of his mother after that time. And, and, and as time went on, she had different ways of showing she didn't think much of him either. Um, but George Washington then had no money. He, he had so little money uh, that he couldn't afford 
to go to dancing lessons, which in the Tidewater of Virginia meant you were really out of it. Uh, he couldn't meet girls. He couldn't take part in assemblies. Uh, he couldn't go to school on a regular basis. He had sort of a pickup crew of traveling tutors uh, come to Fredericksburg and had some lessons there. Um, but what he did learn was he taught himself math. He was a math whiz. I actually had a math professor go over his, his, his math from his the surveying drawings, et cetera. And he had the equivalent of a well-educated American kid after four years of college. His math was, was superior, which would turn into something more than just surveying. It was trigonometry was very helpful with fields of fire and artillery. Uh, but he learned surveying and he was so good at it as, he, as a, as a 15 year old. Uh, that he was hired by the only English lord that ever came and settled in, in, in North America before the revolution, Lord Fairfax. And Fairfax took a liking to George Washington, sort of kept him around to meet other officers, other gentlemen, and also put him to work as a surveyor. So he went out on the frontier and George Washington fell in love with land. He could never get enough land. Uh, by the time he died, he had 51,000 acres. Uh, but we'll come back. That's another part of the story. But his, his thirst, his quest, his unquenchable thirst for more land explains what he was after with land. He wanted, he want, he, he wanted to eventually to build a canal along the Potomac to sort of connect with the Ohio River and down to the Mississippi. He thought on a big scale about what would happen if you had enough land. And he fought to have land as a, a militia officer for Virginia in the French and Indian Wars. I'm not gonna get into his whole military history. It's been very well gone over. But again, he, he, didn't, he didn't have money. Uh, as a young officer, he, he hoped to have enough to have a, a nice saddle and nice boots uh, and uh, uh, a nice uniform. But when he rode off with Braddock's expedition to fight the French at Fort Duquesne, he had to borrow a horse. He still didn't have a, a horse of his own. He borrowed one from a neighbor's wife. Uh, so he, he, it took him a long time to put together enough money. And, and he inherited Mount Vernon from his half-brother's widow, it was nothing like it is now. It needed everything. Apparently the roof always leaked for many, many years. Uh, but he didn't have the money to take care of it. After five years of fighting on the frontier as the head of Virginia's militia, he happened to be coming home. He was in bad health. He lost a lot of weight. He was beginning to lose his teeth. Uh, he had malnutrition from eating uncured meat. And on the way home, he heard of a young widow uh, Martha, uh, Martha Dandridge Cuscus, and stopped by to pay his respects. Well, they hit it off, we, we should say. Uh, Washington sent his servant and the horse home. He stayed overnight, and the next day they were engaged. But then he went off to war again. Uh, and, and you pick up little tidbits of his frustration with the English at this very early stage, because uh, he ordered, he was... He was always conscious of, of having a very neat hand, and very careful letter writing. And Martha had as much schooling as any woman at the time, maybe even more. But he, he always rewrote all of her shopping lists in his own hand. Um, and so he ordered her gown. He ordered his suit, a special suit from London. While he went off fighting, he wanted the suit made. The suit never got there. The suit never got there until six months after the wedding. Uh, but after fighting for five years, he married Martha. And uh, literally, she became him and he became her in a financial sense. And one of the things that I describe is how after their marriage, he set up something like a wagon trade, a convoy of wagons to take the things from her mansion uh, to his house. Um, Mount Vernon. Everything from the tools in the shed to the bedding to the, the, the food uh, from the larder, etc. Uh, it all moved to Mount Vernon. All became George Washington's, uh, legally, George Washington's estate. So it's that kind of detail where you can see how he 
how he used money as he got it and how he was, he was very, George Washington was a very lucky man. Uh, lucky not only in meeting and marrying Martha, but if you look at his military record, he lost more battles than he won. And he was always praised for it because he was so brave. He was always promoted and given raises after he had done one thing or another, not exactly well uh, as, as a soldier. He wound up temporarily a British general and he loved to pose in his, in his British uniform with his red brigadier's sash. Uh, and that's where we first see him in paintings. Uh, but George Washington was fortunate, he was popular. Uh, he, except for Martha, apparently he was never very lucky in love. In fact, when he was young, he was considered almost freakish at six, four and a half. Uh, and uh, he, he wrote a lot of love letters. And I think it was the same letter he wrote again and again to young ladies. Their fathers thought he'd be great. The, 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 the daughters didn't and, and never even answered his, his letters. But um, his, his great good fortune was meet you, meeting uh, Martha, I think. Um, but then things began to unravel financially because at this point, the French and Indian Wars are over. The French have been defeated. They've given up all of their uh, the land they claimed in North America and taken an island in the Caribbean because it had sugar, uh, bad trade. But um, the British Americans thought they could just divide all the land that the French had had and go west across the mountains and uh, have wonderful estates themselves. And the British said no right away. And I think that's one of the causes of the revolution when they said no. That line, by the way, uh, the proclamation line it's called, runs through Vermont. So where I sit in Burlington would be on the wrong side, illegal, I couldn't be here uh, on the wrong side of the proclamation line. Uh, but. Washington always wanted to go farther west, surveyed wonderful land, uh, discovered coal in West Virginia, uh, but then wanted to import miners from Germany and have a, ca a canal to take it from West Virginia to Europe. I mean, thinking on a grand scale always, but land was at the heart of it. But the British kept restricting Americans. First of all, the British had a huge war debt. Hard to imagine, but according to my calculations, the British war debt was $10 trillion after the Seven Years' War. And rightly or wrongly, they thought the Americans should pay their fair share. Well, Benjamin Franklin's view of that was, why should we pay you when you got all of our trade, exclusive rights to our, our crops, uh, our minerals, etc., And Franklin, that would turn out to be the point of view of most of the founding fathers. But the British were rather, well, ham-fisted as they introduced restrictions on trade and came up with the most unpopular taxes they could have imagined. Uh, uh, in, uh, excise taxes are always unpopular. They, in, you could have a riot in England anyone, anytime anybody tried to tax beer or cider or anything. In America, he had the Stamp Act riots. Well, how did the Stamp Act riots uh, bother, how did the Stamp Act bother George Washington? Well, after a day of riding in the fields and supervising things and working over his ledgers, he liked to play cards at his gaming table uh, at, at, at Mount Vernon with his friends. But if you opened a, a deck of cards, the tax on a deck of cards was high enough for him to hire a farm manager for a month. If he opened a new set of dice, the tax was high enough to buy him two workhorses. So the tax was way out of scale with the actual money Americans had because they didn't have any currency of their own. They were not allowed any currency. The year before the Stamp Act was put into effect, England had passed the Currency Act, which outlawed any American currency or any American banking. So there was no silver or gold to pay the stamp taxes, and the British insisted that you pay in silver and gold. So Sam Adams is sort of the, the classic example of how hard the, this anti-currency law hit. Adams' uh, father, 
had a successful malt business in Boston. He didn't make Sam Adams beer. I have to clear that up. He made the malt that other people turned into beer. Uh, but he was wealthy, and he decided to set up a bank, a land bank, where people could take their developed land and get mortgages, we would call them today, get cash. And the British, after the, the that got to their attention in London, said, you can't do that. You cannot do that. You have to, Mr. Adams, you have to give all that money back yourself. So Sam Adams' father was bankrupted. Sam Adams was a student at Harvard at the time. Dad had to tell him, you can't stay at Harvard. Sam Adams, his first rebellion, I think, said, oh, yes, I will. And Sam Adams waited on table for the other Harvard students. And I think from that, that galling experience, that blow to his pride, uh, he never forgave the British. Uh, and they, he, he, he's, the, he's the real revolutionary, the real rebel uh, of all of them. He never had any money. Uh, Pauline Meyer, a wonderful historian, said that he was, he, he, he couldn't even think in terms of money. He was sort of anti-money. Uh, but uh, I think that experience uh, was telling to see his, his father's, father's fortune and other people's fortunes just with a wave of the, of the quill pen uh, at, uh, in Parliament. So money was an issue. Um, Washington uh, prospered and uh, became a, a volunteer uh, aide to uh, General Braddock attacking the French as they built a fort. Uh, it's now Pittsburgh and went along with him. And what Washington wanted more than anything else, I think was to be a British officer. Uh, he was the only officer on that expedition who wasn't killed or wounded. Uh, he buried Braddock where they couldn't be found. And uh, so the wagons went over and covered his grave so that nobody could desecrate it. But it was a catastrophe for the British, but it was a news bulletin for George Washington, the word passed through the frontier from house to house, the British are beaten, the British are beaten to George Washington. They were saying the British can be beaten, the British can be beaten. He'd seen how disastrously they had organized an, uh, an army and carried out the attack. Um, Boston became the seedbed of the revolution uh, because it was the first one to feel the effects of the British trying to clamp down on trade and to get more revenue. So even before the ink was dry on the Peace Treaty of Paris, uh, customs agents were sent to Boston and they began taking, uh, carrying out searches that were illegal in England uh, using writs of assistance that in England had to be approved by the by the chancellor or the exchequer personally. And what the, what the customs people in Boston were doing was clearly illegal. But you began to get a nucleus of lawyers and merchants getting together for the hearings about this and, and organizing pretty much a business resistance to the new tax measures. Um, so the next person that appears uh, in, in the order of his importance uh, and becomes a, a very close and unlikely ally of Sam Adams is John Hancock. Now, we don't know much about John Hancock. Uh, if we know anything about him, it's John Hancock had a, yes, he signed the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he's, he's the signer. In Boston, there's a big insurance company. Uh, there are maybe some people in the audience have their 401k with John Hancock and they have a high office tower. But for the rest of the country, he's only known as the signature on the Declaration of Independence. In fact, he was, in, he was born poor too, uh, in a different way. His father was a country parson uh, with very little money and um, too many kids and his his father's brother was the wealthiest man in New England, Thomas Hancock, who had no children. He and his wife had new children, and they offered to adopt John Hancock. So John Hancock was went from the, the, the parish house in Lexington uh, to the mansion uh, on uh, overlooking Boston Common uh, on, on Beacon Hill. 
And he grew up as almost a little Lord Fauntleroy, to use an old image, uh, taken to school in a carriage with liveried servants. Uh, the family, his new family had slaves. When Hancock inherited from his uncle, he freed those slaves. Uh, but he grew up with liveried slaves in a mansion and the, 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 the wealthiest people in New England and, and, and in commerce uh, coming to the house, coming to dinner. Uh, his uncle insisted that Hancock go to college. He went to Harvard. Uh, he didn't distinguish himself, but he finished. The part of, of his education that he liked the most was in what we would call grammar school because the last class each day, they went to a different building and practiced penmanship. John Hancock loved penmanship. He loved to sign his name. So it's where, where do you get such pride in, this, in signing something? He got it very early he, he in a beautiful hand. Is, is this a little weird? No. In those days, everything had to be written in the books in correspondence and a good, clean handwriting was essential in trade. So he went to work after Harvard for his uncle uh, and his uncle sent him to England to meet the clients. The Hancock wealth was built on whaling. Um, Hancock had his own ships. They went to Nantucket. When the whalers came in, they would they would buy the whole the whole crop that season, sail to England, sell the ships and the crop, buy other ships, bring them back full of consumer goods, and that was John Hancock's idea. He set up a chain of stores, basically. Uh, so Hancock stores with numbers number four, number five. He trained uh, clerks as managers. He gave them a piece of the action. So he's also introducing called franchising, something called franchising. He was known for generosity. He fed a lot of the poor. And as the British clamped down more restrictions, he was supporting a lot of the families in Boston by putting their husbands to work when they were unemployed uh, by fishing or, or shipbuilding. So he rose through the ranks politically in Massachusetts from select men in Boston to the legislature, to the governor's executive council. He actually got to set up a, a militia uh, and buy it uniforms and artillery, the train band of artillery it was called. So they were the honor guard for the royal governor. Um, so when the revolution came along, and trade was cut off with England. He sent his last ships, all but one, he sent his last ships full of whale oil to England, sold them and took the money and invested it in long running notes that he could draw on at any time on, on, on the English on the Bank of England. And, and then he kept the other ship and gave it to George Washington. Uh, and several of the founding fathers who owned ships and built ships gave them to Washington for his first Continental Navy before you had the real United States Navy. So it, it, it was a merchant's war because the merchants were the ones who were most penalized at first, had the most to be angry about uh, and the most uh, to lose commercially. So Hancock uh, was uh, one who, uh, when the British attacked at Lexington and Concord, they were looking for Hancock and Sam Adams because everybody else who had resisted the British and their customs duties and the British occupation of Boston, everybody else was given uh, amnesty except for Hancock and Adams. And they were sent by uh, the revolutionaries in Boston to the Continental Congress. Uh, and they actually hiding in, the, in, in basements as the British came, went looking for them uh, from Lexington to Concord. But a little sidelight of that, Sam Adams had no respect for, for, for manners or clothing. Uh, he was best known for hanging out in uh, rumple clothes down on the waterfront or one tavern or another. And he was on revolutionary committees with people with a lot of money, but he wasn't phased by it. But when it was time to go to the Continental Congress, Hancock took him aside and said, you can't go to Congress representing Massachusetts looking like that and insisted on buying him a nice new uh, suit and a hat. 
And then they went off to Philadelphia with Hancock and his aunt's fortunes in bonds and cash in a carriage to literally invest in the, this, this American revolution. So it's one of the reasons he was unanimously uh, um, elected president of the Congress. But the other one was all those years of offices, he, he became known as a moderator, somebody who could pull people together, lead compromises, calm things down, get things done. So I spend a fair amount of the book talking about what the president of the Continental Congress does, because in effect, he was the first president before we had a constitution with an elected president. So Hancock becomes an important figure in all of this. Uh, he wound up signing the Declaration of Independence because uh, he was president. Nobody had the idea yet of signing him. And in fact, for four months, only Hancock's name was on the copies that they printed, which Maine put him right number one on the hit list for the, for the king's troops if he were caught. He would certainly be the one that was sent to England and tried and executed for treason. So he, was, he put himself at great risk by using that big, beautiful handwriting on the document uh, before any other card could be printed and signed. So he was risking his life. He was risking his, his fortune. Um, when the revolution be began in earnest, Americans didn't have any weapons. They didn't have any gunpowder. How do, how, how do you have a revolution without weapons? Well, that was a problem Franklin put his mind to. Franklin had bought and sold guns. He knew all about them. He had armed the militia twice. Uh, he knew that Pennsylvanians could make one gun at a day, one, one a day. It took a gunsmith and his assistant a day to make a gun and cost about $12 um, our money. Um, um, excuse me, their money. Um, but he also knew the French only got $6 for a musket. And he was the one uh, who got together with another wealthy merchant um, and uh, Robert Morris, a merchant and ship owner. Uh, and they put together a secret committee on trade uh, and opened up correspondence with a, a network of merchants that Morris dealt with uh, and others in, in the colony in the Ameri in the British colonies in America dealt with in the Caribbean with agents in Italy, in France, in Portugal, et cetera. So you had the beginning of an international business network uh, at the beginning of the revolution. And the idea was uh, to use the wealth, the natural resources that the Americans had to get help from uh, the F King of France. Now, why would the King of France, a monarch, take on the King of England? Well, the obvious easy answer is, uh, revenge, right? They had lost the their empire in, in North America. Uh, well, that's not the that's not the whole reason. Um, it was it was one of those odd things that, that you find out after years of research. In Europe, the rage was snuff. If you had any money or you were an elite, you took snuff. You took a pinch of snuff, and there's actually a place on your hand. Uh, anatomically, it's known as the snuff box. And you took a pinch of this powdered tobacco, finely ground powdered tobacco, and you put it in your hand and <laughs> snorted it. Uh, the Queen of England, Queen Charlotte, had a special room at Windsor Ca Ca Castle full of her assortment of snuff. Marie Antoinette had her own uh, massive amount of snuff. Uh, people at Versailles in London, it, 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 was an, it was an international rage, but you had to have tobacco. And the French did not have any colonies that grew tobacco. So what was some of the bait that the Americans had to attract the French? Snuff. And Robert Morris was the one who was used to supplying the tobacco uh, to uh, England. Uh, and the idea that the Americans could give a monopoly on tobacco to France, I contend is one of the reasons the French decided to join on the side of the American Revolution. And when it was all over, Robert Morris was the wealthiest man in America, probably uh, I would call him the first billionaire. Um, 
And it was from using American uh, tobacco and other crops, uh, passing them through the Caribbean, where they were met by French uh, escorts of convoys, et cetera. And what we did was we trade our crops and our futures in crops to the French in exchange for weapons. So I've, I've really looked closely at that committee on trade and the, the, the Navy committee that Robert Morris formed uh, and how they found people who would build their own ships and put them to use uh, as what we would call the merchant marine, they would call them privateers. Congress was licensing, licensing uh, ships captains and owners to go out. And if they managed to take an enemy ship and its cargo intact, uh, they had a prize crew on each one, brought it back uh, to port. It was auctioned and the proceeds were split all the way from Washington, who got 10% for his troops, all the way down to the lowest deckhand and powder boy on the ship. And there were very men who started very poor, wound up owning ships and several ships uh, by this device. We did much more damage to the British uh, than, the, than the Royal Navy could, uh, could, could handle. The Royal Navy had to start building bigger ships to escort their merchant ships because they were being attacked by literally a, a few thousand American ships built for profit. So many of America's early fortunes came out of privateering, including Robert Morris's. Robert Morris, when the French came and joined the war, uh, they, no they noticed that every week, every week, he, he, he had a privateering ship coming in another car. And if he didn't have one, he was very gloomy. Uh, you didn't want to do business with him. So the whole question of French aid got very, very much more interesting as time went on. Uh, American diplomats were sent over. Um, they weren't diplomat, diplomats at first. First was Silas Dean of Connecticut. We never hear of Silas Dean outside of Connecticut. Uh, but he was, he was the son of a blacksmith who went through Yale on a scholarship. Uh, and he actually became very wealthy by marrying first one and then another wealthy women. Uh, that meant a lot of people who didn't like him said he got his money uh, by uh, taking the fortunes of wealthy women. So um, he, uh, Silas Dean was the first to go over, Franklin joined him. And when they came home, when they came back to America, the King of England would give them going away presents. So Silas Dean got a snuff box, with a king's portrait on it, with a ring of diamonds around it. And when he came back to Philadelphia to Congress, he was accused of peculation. Uh, uh, he went back to France and he became very poor. Benjamin Franklin, when he came home finally, uh, he came home, the king liked him especially. He gave special orders to give Franklin a very nice gift. So Benjamin Franklin came home with a king's portrait on his snuff, snuff box with 401 diamonds around it. Uh, there's only one left. The family found uses for them uh, over time. Now, why is that important to us? Because in Congress, where they were writing the final draft of the Constitution, somebody objected when Franklin said, oh, by the way, I got this beautiful. Uh, no, 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 that's the kind of thing we're trying to get away from. Any, any briberies. The result of di those diamonds was the emoluments clause in the American Constitution, that American officials could not take any gifts from foreigners without the express permission of Congress. Franklin wound up uh, with much of his property uh, destroyed by the British occupation. Uh, Hancock wound up putting everything into the war, but eventually he became the, the, the governor of, of Massachusetts for a very long time. He was never poor. Uh, Robert Morris, the man who financed the revolution, actually sat and wrote 6,000 hand-signed notes to give to Washington to pay off his army so the troops could go home uh, uh, happily uh, and not mutiny. Uh, Robert Morris put his whole fortune on the line. And Robert Morris, when it was all over and couldn't sell, send any tobacco or anything uh, to the French anymore because the British were clamping down on us once again, uh, Robert Morris wound up in debtor's prison. Three of our signers of the Declaration of Independence wound up in debtor's prison. So were, 
What were their fortunes? Their fortunes came and went. Uh, what, did they, what did they all get out of it? What Robert Morris treasured most when he finally went through the first bankruptcy court and came out and wrote to his son, he didn't have a penny left in the world, but I am a free citizen of the United States of America. What did they get? They got American independence. Great. Thank you so much, Willard. We have a few questions already from the audience. Uh, the first one here, it's from Mary Ann. She was wondering if you could speak on how uh, Franklin, Je uh, um, Jefferson, and Washington, what portion of their fortune fortunes was based on the value of their enslaved persons? Well, Franklin, nothing. Um, Washington, actually, soon after he married Martha, he stopped buying slaves. He didn't slave any, he didn't import any more slaves. Uh, he, he saw that the British were taking three quarters of everything that they earned anyway in taxes and fees. So he changed his business model from raising tobacco to raising wheat which he could sell to the neighboring farmers and then export uh, all over. It was much less labor intensive. It didn't require uh, all that backbreaking uh, field work of slavery. And what he started to do was an import tenant farmers instead uh, to live on his lands and pay rents. So he was trying, I think he was trying to find a way out. Two thirds of the slaves were dower slaves of Martha's. Washington could not free them. They belonged to the estate of her former husband and would go through to his heirs. Uh, Jefferson, Jefferson is the world's worst compulsive shopper. Uh, he, he married a woman uh, whose father was a slave trader. So their wedding present was a shipload of slaves that they could not sell because there was a, a boycott of anything to do with England, uh, including uh, importing more slaves. So their wedding present was all of a sudden he has 135 enslaved people. He never figured out uh, how to free them personally because he, he, he could rationalize anything. And his reasoning was that for one person to do it did not solve the problem. There were some people who were doing it, but it had to be the responsibility of the governor, government to free all of the slaves and that the owners should be compensated, not the slaves, but the owners. So that, that gave him sort of an out. He also, he never paid his debts. They kept mounting and mounting and mounting and how he rationalized never paying his debts to English merchants that he owed a fortune to growing all the time, was that when the British army came through Virginia, they devastated three of his plantations, killed his, his best stud horse, and slaughtered the ponies who were too small to pull wagons. So he came up with his rationale that the British had done more damage to him than uh, he owed any merchants, so he just kept sinking more and more into debt. Uh, he actually tried to sell slaves from one plantation, but by this time, nobody had any money. After the revolution, everybody was dead break. But by the way, Franklin, um, not Franklin, Jefferson and Washington had one other thing in common. They were land rich, but cash poor. There was a long depression after the revolution. Nobody had any cash. Nobody could buy their land. Nobody could buy their slaves. Uh, nobody had any money. Uh, nobody could pay rent. And it led to an uprising in Massachusetts uh, when everybody was so, so poor and so broke. So to what extent was their fortune based on slavery? Uh, almost entirely. Um, and that can got kicked down the road until the Civil War finally ended it. I think the worst thing that happened with the Founding Fathers is when they had two opportunities to end slavery. One in the Declaration of Independence, uh, they cut out the anti-slavery clause that Jefferson had written into it, blaming the, the English king for the slave trade. It hit the cutting room floor then. And in the Constitutional Convention, they had another opportunity and there was still so much resistance from the slave owners uh, that they said, well, 20 years later, we won't talk about it anymore in Congress for another 20 years. So they kept putting it off and putting it off, and putting it off. And uh, more and more slavery uh, became the entire economy of the South. Willard, 
Thank you so much. I'm afraid we're out of time this evening, uh, but it has been a real pleasure. Um, the book is The Founder's Fortunes. You can order it at Northshire.com. Um, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Willard, it's My been pleasure. a delight. Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone.